As we get started today, I'd just like to acknowledge that the country for Aboriginal peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. Our colleagues joining us today are from many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by this sacred landscape, from freshwater to bitter water to salt, from city to urban to rural. We acknowledge the custodianship of the Aboriginal people of this place and space that has kept alive the relationships between all living things. We acknowledge the real and devastating impact of colonisation on Aboriginal countries and peoples and further commit ourselves to truth telling, healing and education. We'd like to commence by welcoming you, welcoming, you, welcoming you all to the World Access to Higher Education Day for 2021. On behalf of the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education and the Equity Practitioners in Higher Education Australasia, Sarah O'Shea and myself, Kylie Austin, would like to warmly welcome you to this event. The theme of the White Head event this year is to explore the current issues facing equity practitioners, as well as thank equity practitioners from across the sector for your continued efforts in 2021. 2021 has continued to present significant challenges for the higher education sector as universities have responded to ongoing financial impacts of COVID-19. Whilst this has presented acute obstacles for equity practitioners, often in the form of restructures, resources, funding, and increased reliance on staff and student uh, support services, it has also led to innovative practices and a continued commitment to enabling equitable access and participation in higher education. So that today is about saying thank you. Thank you for the work you have undertaken. Thank you for the work you're planning to undertake to ensure that all students have the opportunity to access and succeed in higher education. Over the course of this two hour session today, you'll have the opportunity to hear from Professor Maria Rossetti about navigating heightened risk amongst low SES students in Buca times. What's the next best step? We'll then be joined by uh, accessibility practitioners and students who will be discussing accessibility considerations when returning to an on-campus learning model. We'll be celebrating our 2021 Champions for Change and also announcing the recipients of our inaugural Spotlight on Equity Impact Grants. Uh, feel free to jump onto the chat today and introduce yourselves to your fellow equity practitioners from Australia and New Zealand. And to get us started this, this afternoon, we'll hear from Graham Atherton, the Director of the National Education Opportunities Network, who drives the Wahed Initiative internationally. Thanks, Kylie. I too, before we get going, I'd just like to acknowledge the country that I'm currently sitting on, which is the Wajak Nungar lands, and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and future. As Kylie has indicated, we've got quite a jam-packed uh, session today. So without further ado, I'm going to start with our uh, short video from Graham Atherton that, that has come winging its way from uh, the UK. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, for those of you who do not know, my name is Professor Graham Atherton, and I'm Director of the National Education Opportunities Network here in the UK. Uh, which is the organisation which convenes World Access to Higher Education Day, or WAHED. So fantastic that you are all engaged again in WAHED. I'd really like to thank Kylie and all the colleagues at EFIA and also Sarah and her colleagues at the National Centre of Student Equity being such strong supporters of WAHED over the years. We're at the fourth uh, World Access to Higher Education Day now, uh, and over the past four years, we have had well over a thousand organizations across the world have in some way participated in Wahed, either by taking part in one of our events or in organizing or leading their own events. We've also had participants from over 100 countries taking part in this initiative. And it's never been more important than now that we have a World Access to Education Day. Uh, over here in the UK, uh, as in many other parts of, of the world, of course, uh, our students from uh, low income and other uh, marginalized groupings have suffered the most during the pandemic. And the work that you and ourselves and uh, our colleagues across the world uh, have been doing now and for many years to provide opportunities to succeed and enter higher education for those who would not have had the chances before. That work, of course, has been challenged both by the direct impacts of the pandemic, and the impacts it has had upon the way governments, and I'm sure uh, I believe that to be the case very much uh, over in Australia, and has been the case to a degree here as well, are able to support uh, the work that we're all doing. Uh, I hope you'll continue 
to support and be engaged in Wahed going forward. We know, however, that one day per year is never enough uh, for that global discussion. I think particularly for us here in Wahed, we're thinking hard about how we can create some more sustainable opportunities to engage across the world uh, in how we can share practice, share knowledge and collaborate and work together to create opportunities for our students in their own places to progress and succeed in higher education. Now, international conversation has never been more important, really, before Wired. Uh, I think particularly from a UK and Australia perspective, we are probably two of the countries that have had the longest history, if you like, of sustained and systematic work to support access and success uh, in higher education for those in different groups. Yet at the same time, while well, I think I'm proud of the work that my colleagues and others have done over the years and progress we've made, and I'm sure that you are as well, we know that progress is slow and hard fought and constantly under threat. Therefore, we need to work together to look for new ideas and partners across the world, make new alliances and create new arguments to support our work, both to policymakers, to institutions, and most importantly, in terms of how we engage the best way possible for those students who wish to, enter, to support to enter and succeed in higher education. I wish you luck with your event today. I thank you so much for participating in Wahed. If you are, of course, uh, somebody who can't sleep at night, then do please get on to our conference tonight. So we've got well into the night for you times, and if you can't sleep and, uh, and you're in some night, it's getting warm for you guys over there. Do stay up and try and watch the conference. So if not, try and catch it on recording as well. Enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, thank you for supporting Wahed, and I hope to have a chance to engage with you again, and maybe one day even, possibly uh, face to face, something we can all possibly aspire to. So good evening or good day over there, and enjoy the event. Well, I'm sure you agree uh, that um, Graham introduces the event very well. And uh, for those in Somniax in the audience, feel free to join him later on uh, this evening. So we'll now move to our keynote for today, which is uh, Maria Rossiti. Um, Maria is going to talk about navigating the heightened risk among low SES students in VUCA times. What's the next best stop? So I'm just going to briefly introduce Maria. I could talk, I'm sure many of you know Maria, but I, and I could talk uh, at length about Maria's achievements. But um, Maria is a social marketer who is, uses marketing tools and techniques to bring about social justice and behavior change. change. Uh, Maria is also the director of the Indigenous and Transcultural Research Center and is a adjunct fellow with the National Center for Student Equity in Higher Education. Uh, and Maria was part of an Australian government departmental task force assisted with the 2019 National Regional Rural and Remote Tertiary Education St Strategy. Maria is also a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and is regularly engaged as an expert advisor undertaking several large scale research projects. And so we are absolutely delighted to have Maria with us today. I will stop sharing my slides so Maria can put her slides up um, and over to you, Maria. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction and welcome to World Access to Higher Education Day. I'm coming to you today from beautiful Gubby Gubby country here on the Sunshine Coast. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is this idea of risk uh, amongst low SES students, but really I want to focus in on VUCA times because I think that's something that's really going to shape WP. I wanted to start off today, however, by saying thank you. Thank you to you, the WP practitioners out there who've demonstrated nothing but strength and resilience to keep the path lit and keep the doors of opportunity open for those in our priority groups. You've made a difference and you've enabled another generation of people to reach their dreams and seek their full potential. So thank you, I say that. I'd also like to say thank you for joining me today. You know, we're in this funny space, this space in between pandemic and post-pandemic, and it all happens to coincide with Wahid Day. In particular, we find ourselves at this time of the year and at the moment drawing breath and perhaps reflecting on the last 18 months and trying to process the magnitude of the amount of change that we've seen across the sector, 
in terms of policy. Many of you have no doubt experienced restructures within your institutions and may find yourself in a different space with different criteria and, and different goals. But as we find ourselves in this space, let's not focus so much on the losses that have befallen us, but let's focus on the positives. So I want to instill a bit of hope in the presentation today because there's one thing I've learned over time. Well, a few things actually. I've learned that the WP community is an empowered community. It's an agentic community. It's a positive community. And in fact, it's a community of action. So today, let's play with the idea of a new WP playbook. Let's reimagine what will happen post pandemic and what the future has to offer for us. Let's start to write our own narrative rather than waiting for others to write us for us. Now, VUCA is a phrase that you may not have heard before. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity as key dimensions that represent the time in which we live. Now, I'm sure just in saying those, you realise and can see them in your own lives in the last uh, 18 months in particular. But one thing we know is that VUCA times are likely to be a permanent fixture in our space in WP. So let's not waste time thinking about the way things were. Let's waste time instead on keeping our eyes on the horizon and our fingers on the pulse. And let's find a way to navigate VUCA time so that we can help the next generation reach their full potential. So the pandemic, look, no doubt the pandemic has transformed higher education. It's taught us lessons that we perhaps never wanted to learn. But in short, it's been a paradigm shift for all of us in our lives and in our work. It's sort of been like, I'd like to describe it as a bit of a full stop, like punctuation in the WP narrative, punctuation in our lives. It, it pulled us up, it made us stop and think and reflect. It sparked change, it created inspiration. And I'd like to think that we should, as a community, take this opportunity now to transform Look, the pandemic will have a long tail. And what that means is that in the coming months and years, we'll see some of the fast made decisions that were made in the last 18 months unfurl. Some of those decisions will be good, some may not, some may be retracted, some may be changed and adapted, and some may just be um, you know, withdrawn or ignored. But we know there's a long tail to the pandemic and that's why it's important for us now to keep our finger on the pulse and our eye on the horizon, to look for the acorns and not the oak trees. So WP may now find itself, uh, all of us, in the eye of a perfect storm. Things are a bit calm at the moment because we're in this in-between space. And in this quiet space, we have an opportunity to take the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic and then try to think about what they might look like in a post pandemic world. So we find ourselves today at this peculiar junction, this place in between and also on World Access to Higher Education Day. Now look, while many things are different, there are many things that are also the same. So it's really an important time to take stock and to reimagine the future and to spark new thinking in this in between times. Now, while there's many unknowns in life, there's one thing that we do know is that after the pandemic rain will come the post pandemic rainbow. So our future is as bright as we want it to be. And I want us to focus on this, what's, what's about to happen and what's about to occur. There's lots of colours and ideas and new thoughts that are around us. And I think this is a time for WP to embrace that optimism, that resilience, that strength, that positivity, and also to think outside the box. It's time for radical creativity, to start to reimagine different ways. And the reason for saying that is that while there's been lots of losses during the, the pandemic for WP, we have an opportunity. And the opportunity that we have around us is because we are no longer encumbered by the grand script, the previous script, the way things were. We're emancipated in some ways. We have freedoms that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So let's take that opportunity. So it's time for optimism. It's time for radical creativity. And it's time for what I've called WP+. So as you saw, I'm, I do have a marketing background. So I do like a little bit of branding and something a bit bright. So I've called it WP+, because this is our rainbow. Now, what we know, look, WP+, what we know is the same is that perceived risks are still there. Our priority groups still have the same concerns about coming to university as they did pre-pandemic. 
But what we do know is that they're heightened. They're more amplified. They're more top of mind and they're affecting our priority groups earlier. Families and communities are thinking about these things at an earlier stage because the grand script is no longer there. Does going to university guarantee access to a future career in an area that people want to be in? And what will future careers look like? So we know that there's nothing that's, so, so in many ways, let's work with it. Another part of the WP plus landscape is that we know that these risks are heightened because we now live in VUCA times and we're going to continue to live in VUCA times as well. VUCA, as I mentioned, stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So I think if we start to consider this WP plus playbook and we work these as the principles that we know are going to be there, we're going to have more realistic approaches to our strategies and tactics and not so much be taken by surprise, so to speak. So volatility means rapid and reactive change. <laughs> Many of you are probably smiling because that reflects very much what's been happening in the last 18 months. So we've seen rapid and unexpected change, not only in terms of lockdowns, but we've seen rapid changes with teaching delivery models, for example. Uncertainty is the idea that there's pending changes, that we've got what they call known unknowns. So that's the long tail of the pandemic. That's all those decisions that are still making their way through committees that are going to change and impact the way that we do business and do our work in our communities. So uncertainty has lots of implications because it may impact, for example, the role of ATARs uh, and how they're going to be seen in the next few years. It may also be in progress changes to programs and delivery models that are still going to roll out in coming times. So these are things that we know of, but we're uncertain about how they're going to affect and the implications that they have. Complexity is this idea of having more decision points. So our students in our priority groups, us as WP practitioners, we now have greater complexity. There's more options, there's more decision points, which means more thinking, and that makes it even more risky for many of our students. It was already complicated, and now it's even more so. Ambiguity is the idea of unknowns and how many there are of them. There's quite a lot of unknowns going forward. And I think in many ways through the pandemic, we've become very adaptable to things. With ambiguity though, we wanna stop being reactive and we wanna to start to being responsive because that's healthy for everybody. So in these VUCA times, the perceived risks of going to university are heightened. Now what VUCA does is it amplifies those perceived risks. And in my um, fellowship that I had the honour of doing with the National Centre for Higher End Education, um, I focused on looking at these perceived risks. I identified 10 risks. They're still there. They're just more amplified. And those risks included functional and future work risks. That concern by our priority groups that universities aren't going to lead to their preferred occupation. And in terms of future work, what will that future occupation be? Physical risks such as safety and damage, well, we've seen that through lockdowns and, and changes to how people interact on campus. Sensory risk is unwanted impact on our senses. So perhaps the impact, for example, of online learning um, on, on people themselves in terms of their sight and hearing, for example. We also know psychological fears that people have where they're concerned about how well they will do in university, whether university is a waste of time, whether they're going to be um, burdened with so much debt or, or monetary loss that that makes them hesitate before coming to university and whether they'll potentially lose motivation or lose study skills. The most interesting of the risks that I identified was that of social class risk, and it still remains. That sense that once um, you leave, for example, a low SES community or your home, that you can never go back that people will think you're snobby, that by going to university, you'll be transformed and you won't fit back with the people you love and care about. But out of all these risks in our VUCA times, one of the key things that stands out and remains the strongest of all those risks is functional and future work risk. So in our WP plus playbook, maybe just focusing in on that is the best next best step. So let's unpack it a bit. So I probably wanted to sort of 
you know, address the elephant in the room, what's one of the key areas of functional risk for both us as WP practitioners and for our incoming students, their families and communities? Well, VUCA has changed the way that courses are delivered. There's a huge variety of combinations of face-to-face -face and, and online learning and what that looks like. Uh, and it's been quite sort of div diverse, divisive, sorry. People tend to have been falling into two camps. And, and if those of you who are reading in the media, for some people, they see all these blended learning options as magic. For others, they think it's messy. For some of us, we see it as choice, that it's giving choice to our students. For others, they think it's creating confusion for our students. Some see blended learning as engaging and enlightened, while others see it as homogenizing and humanless. Now the jury's out. This is going to be a part of the long tail of the pandemic. As blended learning options remain in a post-pandemic time, what's it going to be? Magic, messy, providing choice or confusion, engaging or humanless. We'll have to see how it rolls out, but this is one of the many risks that we see emerging and that parents, students and their communities are thinking about and talking about. What we also know in terms of the future work element is that VUCA makes it harder for, or even harder, I should say, for people to plan ahead. We know that there's new careers and new jobs that have emerged contact tracing, for example, has become an occupation that wasn't necessarily there before. What this also means is that as we move into the long tail of the pandemic, these rolling changes as they start to occur, make it difficult for us to know and to advise our students as to what university life will be like and whether it can or will lead to an, a job in the area of their preferred occupation. So we know that when we're engaging with our students in our enrichment activities and we're in those schools and we're out talking to our community, it means too that we have to make sure that we advise people of the complexity and the changes that are occurring. Because in many ways, we can no longer promise the old model. We have to make sure that we're providing information on what may be occurring and what, the, what university may, life may look like in a year or two time. But future work has always been there. It's been around since about 2016. It makes it hard for us to plan ahead because after all, our students want to begin with the end in mind. One of the first questions we ask is what job do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? And once we have that endpoint, that endpoint effectively represents the North Star, the compass. And it's we've then designed pathways through university, through school to help students to navigate that space so that they can head towards their North Star. But what we're seeing in VUCA times is that there may be more than one North Star. And in fact, that North Star may move. So this is going to be a challenge for us, but of all the communities out there, I think the WK P community is one that's ready and resilient and able to um, take on this challenge. So what's the next best step? I'd encourage WP plus, I think take advantage of this in-between time that we find ourselves in and steel ourselves against some of the challenges that we face, but also to take the opportunity to rewrite the playbook to see things through a new light and to take that positive view because after this pandemic rain will come our post pandemic rainbow. So bringing it all together, while there's lots of unknowns, there are some things that we do know. We do know that risk remains, it's just heightened. We also know that VUCA times are here to stay. So let's not swim against the current. Let's take those things together and stitch them together into a new playbook that inspires, that offers optimism and hope, and that enables our next generation to reach their full potential. So on that note, I hope you've got a lot of takeaways. I hope that's inspired some change for you. And I'd like to thank you for listening today. Oh, thank you, Maria. That was so inspiring. Um, and I know that people will be mulling that over in their minds. So I'm just going to invite um, anyone who'd like to uh, pose any questions for Maria, because we do have time. Uh, we have about five or eight minutes for questions now. Uh, so please pop your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box, because uh, as you know, it's quite difficult to find the questions if they go into the chat box, because we have so many people who've been in there 
So um, if anyone has any questions for Maria, then please do that now. But Maria, um, I suppose from as I'm listening to you and I'm learning a lot of new language um, and I love the way you talked about how we're in in between times and we've got to rewrite the playbook. Um, and I'm thinking that for many people out there who are probably quite exhausted coming out of lockdown, are there sort of some small things that we could look at doing as practitioners in 2022? What, what would you see as some initial steps um, to sort of embracing the VUCA times? Probably one thing, um, uh, and I've actually just been writing about this, which I will share on your Neshi blog in time, um, in terms of the next best steps is actually sort of going back to key principles that matter. So one of the things I've heard through the grapevine through, you know, anecdotally is that when WP practitioners are out there talking with community and talking with students, feeling disingenuous in that sense of saying, this is what uni's life is going to be like. And then we know it's changing. We know there's these dynamic shifts that are outside of their control and they're happening in a reactive way. So one of the suggestions I put forward was actually starting to build a statement of ethics for WP that has some key principles that sit around this just so people can come together to say things. And I've got it in front of me, actually. I've got it. Um, so things like this idea of a basic principle of non-maleficence, do no more harm. We know that's an underpinning. Let's put some words around that and put it into a, a document. Other things, for example, like integrity, which we do, conducting ourselves with the highest of high, to the highest standards of conduct. I think sometimes these things are important to have that sort of, um, uh, I guess, anchor for those in the community, in the WP community, so that they can start to address it. I think when I say that people are feeling that that sort of sense of talking to students and making promises that may not necessarily be kept or that we're, we're saying this is what uni life is like, knowing that it's very different. I think it's important in many ways for us to have to centre ourselves around a code of ethics. I think that will actually be quite helpful. The other one I had put forward in terms of a way to go forward is to refocus on a strengths based framework and what that looks like. So um, in the thing I've been writing about, talking about some key principles about that. So, for example, um, uh, focusing on goals that are not only tailored to the person, but that accept and acknowledge that the person is the expert in their own life. And that we adhere to two important things. One is called an ethics of care, caring for, with and about, and also adhering to what I think something that's always been there, but we've never put words around, which is trauma-informed care. Mm -hmm. Many of our students and ourselves come from and have experienced trauma, but by infusing these two aspects to goal development, when we're talking and we're saying to students, what do you want to be when you grow up, that we know that we're looking at them through this multidimensional sort of lens um, with it. And that strengths framework, I think, will help to sort of bring people together and sort of consolidate the key principles of what we do. The other thing is for there's four of them, but I'll just mention the other thing, which is about actions, about bolstering hope, but not just doing that, but up uplifting confidence and prompting purposeful action. So not just getting people to think about what do you want to do, but to take that step, move it towards that actual behavioural action that will help them. And a part of that is them believing in that North Star. Um, and understanding that North Star may move a little bit in the sky, but adaptability is is actually going, is a life skill now and will be in the future. So sorry, a long answer to a short question, um, but I have and am writing something about those things at the moment that I'll share. That sounds, that sounds great. And I, I, I agree with you. I think having things written down, uh, I think is very helpful to us all. So while we all intuitively know what, what we do and what our practice should look like, actually having it written down is so, um, so strong, I find, and, and provides a framework then for, for practice. So, so thank you for sharing that. We do have some questions that have come in. And for those of you who are uh, looking at the Q&A, you can vote for questions as well, but I'm going to just do them as they appear on my screen. So um, Louise Harris has asked, in your research, Maria, what were some of the common goals that WP students were hoping to achieve via higher ed? And how do you think unis could better help 
those students to achieve those goals. Yeah. So I think this sort of goals fall into two categories. There's what we call the manifest goals. That's what people tell you. And usually that's around the lines of, I want to become or work, I want to become a professional in X. So they, it's employment related is often the goal that's there. That's because that's something that we're used to sharing. But underneath that, our goals, we have what's called latent goals. Those are the sort of hidden ones. And sometimes it's to prove to themselves that they are capable. Sometimes it's about self-actualization, being all that they can be and what they want to be. And we know that going to university has lots of mixed feelings too. And I think that's where it gets confusing for students because they're trying to measure up. I'm excited, but I'm scared. I'm glad to be going away, but I want to stay home. And it's this pull and pull of these, a pull and push, sorry, of these tensions that make it difficult. I think given the policy environment that we live in and the world we live in, most people focus just in on those employability um, goals rather than that sort of, I want to discover or explore or find out more about myself. Um, and those tend to be pushed into the shadows these days. So I think when we ask what are common goals, I'd say most people are going to bring up the goal around employment because we know it leads to social mobility and that allows people to reauthor their future and to break the chain of, of intergenerational poverty, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Jody uh, St. Clair has asked, Maria, how do you think this particularly impacts on Indigenous or Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students? Yeah, um, I think for... Um, I think it's going to be all of those types of risks are already pronounced. We know too that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students have good employment outcomes upon graduation. It's just getting to graduation and coming in. Um, under the current policy settings and which came some of which came from the Napthine review that I was on, um, was about the fact that Indigenous, um, sorry, that universities can enrol Indigenous students above the cap, so they're not within the cap. So a, an Indigenous student who, who wants to come to university can uh, in those sense too. One of the, the observations I've made over many years has been, uh, in fact, decades, a project I did back in the 2007, uh, was absolutely noticing the advanced level dropout for Indigenous students. Um, and I think what happens is that those risks that many address at the beginning before enrolling for Indigenous students remain throughout the entire length of the journey. And in particular, that social risk that I mentioned. I, I had in the slide there, people will think I'm snobby, but for Indigenous students, that social risk is high. Because what it means is that you will reach a point where people will say, you no longer fit in our community because you've gone to uni. You think you got tickets on yourself or whatever. Now, I, I can say that because I, being Aboriginal, I know lived experience, I speak from my own experience of you don't fit anymore. And I think sometimes for advanced level dropout that we're seeing with Indigenous students, it's because while there's excitement about the students going in the first place, as they near the end, there's that sense of you're not going to you're not going to fit in um, or you you may not fit in like you you did previously or people will see you as different in your community um, and that's powerful it's mm -hmm. just really powerful so I think social risk is um, there but as I said all of those risks tend to persist throughout the, the full journey for Indigenous students. Well, thank you Maria yeah it's sort of um, the symbolic violence involved in going to higher ed um, yeah, so um, Rebecca has, and I, we've got three questions. I don't think we're gonna have time for all of them, but if we don't get to, to all of them, we will um, try and uh, answer those maybe via email or um, another way, Marie, if that's okay with you. But Rebecca has asked, and it's a great question. Uh, I would love to know if you have any tips on how to work productively with those that are um, the leaders in, in the institution who are perhaps caught up with the old model. Yeah, um, those who are caught up with the old model and sometimes um, that's a really good question actually because you know you sort of think you know and many of us who work in institutions it's you know you heard those phrases you know managing up and all the rest of it but I think a part of it sometimes can be just that level of diplomacy of showing that there is a new way and a new approaches to things. I, I find it we're in interesting times because on one hand we've got people who are who are 
holding tight to the old models. And on the other, in, the, in exactly the same institution, we've got huge appetites for change, like massive appetite for continuous change because we've made change at the same time. So sometimes with WP, you're stuck in this space in between while delivery models are changing rapidly and quickly and programs are, are moving and courses are moving and changing at the same time there's this old grand script that that still exists is that this is the place where WP is and I think that that refresh will really just have to come through <laughs> diplomatic conversations um, with it but you know as I mentioned before coming up for example with um, more national WP frameworks, I think will then provide a tool that people can use to talk with um, the decision makers within their institution as well. Um, and that is, is, is one way of going about it. The fact is, is that um, as we, as domestic enrolments are going to, to bolster up again, we're going to see more students coming through in 2023 and beyond um, sort of post the, the early 2000s baby bonus we're seeing a population a natural population increase that we also know that many of those students uh, are going to be coming to university and occupying spaces and many of those students come from marginalized backgrounds um, so in some ways i probably have danced around the question there but it is a it is a challenge for everyone and perhaps by having some types of community or national-led frameworks that will actually help us to give voice and reason and perhaps you could have a community of practice um, Sarah, where people share their advice and tips for how they've managed upstream, so to speak, to ensure that um, the new world offering that we have is, is seen and, and known. Yeah, good idea, Maria. Thank you. Now, there are two more questions left, but we are going to have to move on because we've run out of time. One of those was related to blended learning and, and with the vaccine, um, you know, single doses and double doses. And the other one was related to teaching uh, or helping uh, teaching staff better understand the needs of WP students. But we will uh, ask Maria to maybe answer those via um, written mode. So I, we're, I want to thank Maria. Uh, thank you so much, Maria, for a really thought provoking keynote address. I, I, I'm sure others like myself are going to go away and think about that and dwell. And we really do look forward to those principles. And of course, the National Centre and indeed EFIA would um, be very happy to assist in disseminating those in any way we can. So next, we're going to move on to um, our panel. Um, and I'm just going to um, share my screen again. So bear with me. Um, so the panel we have is uh, looking at the return to campus. Um, and I'm going to ask my panelists or the panelists uh, to please turn on their, their cameras. Um, so we have a, 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 a selection of both staff and students to discuss this issue. So I'm going to just briefly introduce everyone. And if you could give a little wave to the, to the camera as I do that. So we have Anthony Gardner, who's the manager of accessibility at La Trobe University. Um, we have Erica Schultz, who is a Bachelor of Arts student at uh, La Trobe University, Broke America. Uh, we have Yasmin Parsons, uh, who's a Bachelor of Psychological Science, Social Science student at the University of Wollongong. Welcome. And Darren Britton, who is uh, with the National Assistive Technology Office at ADSET. So welcome, Darren. And um, I'm going to kick off and Kylie and I are going to take turns posing questions uh, to the panel. So I wonder if I could start with Anthony um, and ask if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your journey to higher education. Thanks, Sarah, and good afternoon, or morning, everyone. Um, I am a social worker by background, but I was always drawn to the education environment. Uh, I loved the smell of books. I used to just wander around the stacks, looking at the books and smelling them, but I can't do that anymore because it's all digital. Uh, but yeah, I've been in the higher ed sector uh, for about 16 years now. Thanks, Anthony. And Erica? Um, hi, I'm, I came into university as a mature age student um, after a short um, career in retail that was pretty unfulfilling, I would say. 
Um, and unlike, I guess, um, what Maria said, sort of most people do, I actually am pursuing personal interest rather than any, I'm not sure I'll find any viable employment from what I'm doing, but hopefully. Um, but yeah, I came to pursue um, personal interests in my studies. Erica, I go go with your heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan. Uh, Yasmin, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am, I went straight, to, I actually didn't go from high school. I'm still, I'm doing an undergraduate degree, but I decided I needed to take a gap year, travel the world. Thankfully, I did before, you know, COVID, got back right in time, um, and then came back to start my degree last year in a world of online learning. So I still don't necessarily know where I want it to take me, but um, I've always known and had a passion for helping people and being able to have the skills to talk to people. So that's kind of why I ended up doing a double in social science and psychological science and just seeing where the wind takes me at this point, I think. That's great. Thank you, Yasmin. And certainly not last, but certainly not least, Darren, would you like to give us a brief intro as well? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that, Sarah. Um, yeah, where the wind blows you. Thank you, yes. But that's um, as it's kind of the story of my life as well. I went to uh, to university straight from school, as was the expectation kind of thing. Did a year of um, audio uh, of uh, electronic engineering and decided this was pretty boring. This wasn't for me. And university has that wonderful opening of doors and opportunities of a whole range of things I'd never even considered. Um, and one of those was to do audio engineering. So I ended up leaving university and going uh, to a separate Provider to the School of Audio Engineering, and then did a postgraduate with um, with uh, with them, and ended up getting a job back at La Trobe University um, to set up a radio station for students. So I fell back in love with the university and with students again. Um, then left again, set up a web design multimedia business, um, and then in two thousand and four ended up um, back at La Trobe University again, um, just when the disability standards for education were coming in. Um, so we were looking at how do we now apply web standards because this was the only kind of measuring stick we really kind of had at that time. Um, in terms of delivering you know accessible documents to students and was there up until 2019 um and yeah happily so um some great experience with students and staff uh, working certainly on you know accessibility and um, inclusive documents and those kind of things the whole gamut of those um and now i'm happily with the uh, ad set and the national or the ndco program um with the assistive tech side of things so talking to many universities rather than within one now which is which is fantastic Thanks, Darren. I'm sure we could all write that story where the wind blows us because similarly, I've been blowing around a bit as well. Um, Kylie, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, Erica, I might get you to um, start off the panel by answering this, this first question. Um, so as we're aware, there was a lot of changes that happened during COVID-19 um, to the delivery of teaching, learning and student support services at university. Um, I'm really keen to hear from you, Erica, about, you know, what which of those changes were beneficial? Yeah, I think um, I think it was quite interesting um, in my experience witnessing a lot of the changes um, around the pandemic, both in university, but also in the delivery of other services in the community um, and how all of these um, accessibility needs that people with disabilities have wanted and needed for a long time all of a sudden became um, broadly available and sort of happening um, because the broader community required them as well based on um, this pandemic that had isolated everyone all of a sudden. Um, so I guess from my perspective, um, it was interesting to see that all of a sudden things like um, doing our classes and tutorials via Zoom from home um, was something that was the norm and I was no longer someone who was needing to make um make myself known to my teaching staff as a student who needed changes made for me um because these changes were already made based on the state of the world at the time um and that was yeah it was quite it was quite bizarre for me and at times frustrating to think it took a global pandemic 
um, in order to get the sort of accessibility needs that a lot of us have been wanting for a long time and will they stay when this global pandemic goes away, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks for sharing that, Erica. Yasmin, have you, um, have you, has your experience been similar? Has there been, have, have, what benefits have you seen um, in terms of the delivery of teaching and learning from your personal perspective? Yeah, so I have a little bit it's quite similar and I do agree with Erica. Um, I found that the delivery of online, um, the way that the lectures were set, like made and the fact that there were recorded lectures, sometimes they're over Zoom, but they were always recorded, meant that if something came up, um, you know, on all these unforeseen circumstances over the time, you know, you might have an appointment or whatnot, um, it didn't matter if you could attend the lecture, it was always there for you to access. I thought that was a very, very awesome part of the online learning because when I was on um, campus for like the three weeks that I got to do a bit of on like person to person um, learning, I found that I did not get as much out of these lectures as I did um, online where I could like pause. Oh, that was a great point. I'll take that back a few seconds. I'll quickly write that down. And I found that that really helped to build my knowledge on my subjects. I also felt that um, the Moodle was really, um, for most of my subjects, was very well written out. So there was a lot of accessibility to discussion pages where you could just post a, pit, uh, a question like, I'm unsure about what this means in the lecture. And you'd have people answering and your um, tutors and coordinators would answer. And so it was able to have this interconnectedness whilst we were still online um, and I found those are really helpful points. I guess one other thing I should mention as well that I found that was a really good is that the UOW, um, they actually became quite flexible on their, um, I guess, extensions and things like that. Um, they no longer had to, you no longer had to have a medical certificate or um, a, a, a form saying that you, you sorry, I can't do this by this date. They were quite relaxed and would understand that, you know, you can't get into a doctor's appointment so much anymore. And so that really helped to ease the pressure off, um, off of, you know, things that you could, the unforeseen circumstances. Um, I myself have um, an, un, like an autoimmune, which I've only been diagnosed in the past year. So I found that I would sometimes just get sick, you know, and I would be like, oh, goodness, I've got to try and got a million assignments to do. I want to push one back. Oh, I've got to get to the doctors. I need to figure out, you know, but now I could just be like, I'm sorry, I'm not well. And that it would be like, no worries, we'll, we'll sort that out. So I found it was actually a lot more um, relaxed, probably isn't the word, but it was a lot more inclusive because it was everyone's going through a lot. And whether it was mental health things, you know, sometimes you get overwhelmed and there's been instances where I've been like, look, I have too much going on. I need to relate, like, you know, I need to just move one back a bit and it was very much like yep how can we help let's move it back and I found that that was something that I think now being part of the disability section of the um, which I've only recently done this semester is an option for that it became an option for everyone which then eased it was very accessible to all whether you had underlying things or whether it was just you needed a to move something back. And I found those were like the three most important things that I found in my online learning. Yeah, yeah thanks Thanks so much for sharing your experience, Yasmin. Um, Anthony, I, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine that a lot of these things that Yasmin and Erica have been, um, have, have raised, you know, have, have been things that you've been advocating for within your institution. How did, how did you find, um, you know, what benefits did you see um, for students and, you know, what, what aspects of the things that the university changed did you think resulted in, in benefits for inclusion and accessibility for students? Well, it's been a, a, a really interesting uh, couple of years watching not just my university, but all universities do things that have been impossible for years. Uh, and all of a sudden barriers fell down and we could make adjustments in very, very quick time. You know, um, we went from face-to-face -face delivery to online delivery in a week. There was a one week of close down and classes re-emerged uh, online. Nobody was prepared for that. Nobody knew how to do it, what, what was involved. It, it just happened. Um, and that's been amazing. You know, for some students, it's worked incredibly well. For others, 
um, who don't like being on camera, don't like um, being in, engaged with the computers all day. It, it hasn't worked well, but it's, um, I think what it's led to is, is the need for universities to be flexible and to deliver in multi, uh, multimodal formats. Um, you know, I think universities are still to some extent based on a very medieval notion of education. <laughs> You know, we come out of the medieval period, that's when units were formed, and, and in lots of ways we're in the 21st century, but in some ways we're still back in the Middle Ages. Um, and you know, we still have conversations across the sector with academics who won't let students record their lectures uh, under a whole set of false premises about you know, um, intellectual property uh, and privacy and, and all sorts of nonsense that really has no validity in the 21st century where students, we know well that students form little groups and one sits at the front of the class and records on their smartphone and shares the lecture with the others. And that, we know that's happening. Why not acknowledge that and work with it rather than try to pretend it doesn't happen? So um, I think Erica and Yasmin made some really important points about the need for flexibility uh, particularly. Um, and I think universities now are at a real point of choice. We can bounce back to everything that we knew beforehand and pretend that the last two years never happened. Or we can, and I think there's a push to do that in some places, in some ways. Or I think we can actually acknowledge what's happened and learn from it and use that to evolve and transition into a new way of learning and a new model of learning that uh, puts choice in the hands of our students uh, and in the hands of our academics and, and empowers people to really make strategic decisions about what they want from universities and how they want it. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Anthony. I think the point that you make around choice, I think is, is you know, really important. And I know from my previous conversations with Erica and Yasmin, that was something that, you know, they really, um, you know, were honing in on as well. Um, Darren, I'm interested in your perspective, you know, being from ADSET and, you know, having a look at, you know, having that kind of bird's eye look over what all the universities were doing um, during this period, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, the things that were beneficial? I think I'll just touch on and, and thank you, Yasmin and Erica. I think that's very reflective, um, you know, the experiences you're saying um, of what's being heard. I'm very much of that silver lining, so it's very pretty, you know, that post post uh, pandemic rainbow uh, situation that's there. I think the pandemic was a fantastic equaliser. As much as it wasn't beneficial for everybody, it brought academics into, as Anthony said, this realm of we can't do that. That's impossible. Um, this subject will never be able to be taught online. It's a face to face only. There, there's no way. Suddenly, everybody had to change, and so it dispelled a whole bunch of firmly held myths, I think, that existed there, um, and they all got thrown out the window, um, and it equalised academics with students. A lot of the academics weren't prepared to use some of the tools that were there and had to adapt really, really quickly, much as the students did, you know, and it was interesting to see a lot of academics working with students over those first few months of the pandemic, particularly in Victoria, um, and, and the real rapid sudden that happened in the ongoing, of um, that empathy that came around with that. Well, look, I'm still working with the tools. Sorry, I'll try and be better at doing this. Um, and so lecturers and academic staff were, were, you know, on the same level for a period of time. And so there was much more willingness to accept, look, I know this is hard and I haven't got this right. Look, can I help in some other way? Can I do this? Can I do this? And everybody was much more open, I think, as you put it, Yasmin, as well, for that choice, for that flexibility and dispelling that we won't be able to offer extensions to everybody. You know, the exam's two hours and exam will only be two hours. It's never going to change unless you put through an adjustment for that to suddenly, the exam's open for 24 hours if anybody wants to wants to wants to do that because we know there's network issues we know everybody will be doing it at different times and we can't coordinate every single subject to the nth degree that we may like within our institution so we need to have this open window because some of our institutions weren't set up to have thousands or tens of thousands of students online at the same time you know because some of it was still geared for some face-to-face -face. um and I think, yeah, in that sense, and the fact that it threw out one of the other big myths, um, which have been fighting against for many years, and that's that, you know, students come in and they're digital natives um, kind of thing. And it, no, or the assumption that we know academics know how to use all the software and technology and learning environments that are there. And so all of that got 
throwing <laughs> throwing throwing out um and i think so we're rethinking and i think that's that's that um as mary said that's that that's that rainbow i think that's there we're rethinking and i think anthony's right if we go back and grab onto some of those but don't keep some of those good things like the you don't have to put in for an extension for everything we can just give some flexibility and we can trust people so i think it gave back a little bit of trust towards some of the students and what you're telling me i can honor that and without having to, well, you need to prove to me X, you need to prove this. All I'm asking for is two more days or one more day or something. There was automatic flexibility built into a lot of things because the scale wasn't just a small percentage of students suddenly, now it was a large number of students. So mm. we need to look at the large cohort of students now. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of those silver linings. I'll keep rabbiting on, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Darren. That's, that's great. Um, Sarah, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, look, I, I just found that so interesting because I think what it points to is that universities have adopted a higher ethos of caring. You know, I've become quite interested in the concept of care and how we can embed care into our university practices. But I'm I'm going to we've talked you've talked a little bit about the benefits and and um, you've mentioned um, some challenges as well. I, I'm actually going to ask um, I'm going to start with uh, Erica, uh, if I can, and, and ask you, what would you like to see uh, that universities uh, continue or consider as they plan to move back to face-to-face? -face? Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, so it's probably something I touched on and actually I can see in the chat that um, another member named Sarah has made a comment on it as well, um, but the, the necessity for those of us with health issues and disabilities to um, to declare ourselves um, as disabled or unwell in order to receive the um, the support and the need that the um, the flexibilities that we need um, is I think quite an antiquated kind of concept and something that a lot of us struggle with. Um, it's not, it's a very personal thing and not necessarily something that we um, all individually want to do. Um, I'm personally quite open. I have a few complex kind of chronic conditions. I have chronic fatigue um, and complex chronic pain and a few others, but all of my conditions are um, invisible. And because of that, um, I face a lot of issues if I do choose to go on campus um, ever when I have better days. Um, so I think it's really important that the flexibility that we've seen to be possible because of the pandemic is continued on a basis that doesn't require you to declare yourself um, as worthy of it, I guess. Um, and it's similar for me in terms of what I've seen in um, with careers that are becoming more accessible for people um, on an at-home basis. Um, so a lot of us, and this may be something that is an internalised feeling as a person with a disability, but a lot of us feel at a disadvantage when we declare ourselves in need of help and in need of support. Um, and so not having to do that is really, really important. So being able to access that blended type of learning where we have the choice to go on campus if there are on campus tutorial, uh, tutorials, but we can also still access recorded lectures um, and we can still access online tutorials and we're not um, having to declare that we need to be solely online and make that choice at the beginning of semester to sort of say, am I going to be so sick this semester that I can't attend at all? Or am I possibly going to be able to attend? And um, it's sort of a volatile thing that a lot of us don't know in advance. Um, so I think that's really important that that flexibility is, is just offered to people in life. Yeah, thank, thank you, Erica. And I, I agree because really that that benefits all students. Um, Absolutely. You know, it's not it, it's everyone on an even playing field in a way, you know, so you you can choose which which modality to engage with depending on, you know, your personal circumstances. So mm -hmm. such a good point. Yasmin, mm -hmm. do you have anything that you'd like to see carried over uh, or planned when when the return to face to face happens? 
Yeah, so um, I thought Erica raised some great points there. Um, I do quite agree with having the, the dual mode of things. So the flexibility to be able to be like, oh, you know, I might, I, I might not, I might just do online. I'm not feeling, you know, whatever it is. And I think it would be interesting to possibly be able to have the option to go to face-to-face -face, um, and then if it's a week you're unwell and then be able to join into a Zoom. I think that that, that flexibility to be able to, oh, okay, um, I'm not well this week or, uh, you know, I'm a bit well unwell, don't want to share that with others because, you know, now it's we've had this raised general, um, I guess, understanding of sickness. Let's not go anywhere when we're sick now. Let's stay at home and keep everyone. And I think that it would be very, it'd be very interesting to do that. And not only that, I actually don't find in-person lectures as um, helpful. And I think that from many students I've spoken to, I live in a share house and now everyone's got different experiences, but the overall general points are that online lectures are really excellent. They allow you to be able to do your work whenever it suits you, whenever you're feeling well or unwell, you know, things like that. And being able to have that online platform for discussion with other students and with, um, I guess, having like discussion pages and maybe I had a, this semester I had a tutor, like a tutor who put up, um, a coordinator who put up a weekly hi guys, this is what we're going to do today, little video, you know, just something to be able to um, keep everyone integrated. I personally cannot wait to go back face to face because I'm a very discussion, you know, would like to get into discussions, which is a, a massive challenge I actually found. I think I found some really beneficial things, but the one thing that I found challenging was my tutorials because you could, just as Anthony um, mentioned earlier, you can hide behind that camera. And I had many tutorials that no one had their cameras on. It was me and a tutor. We were just, you know, just the two faces. And I think that's made it difficult to, to find, to be engaged in that kind of thing, but it was also very understandable. So I think if that gives it, if we have a double, like a dual option of being able to do a bit of both, then it means that we can accommodate for those who don't necessarily feel as confident on the camera and they can head to in person and have a lot more, get more out of it. But if it's something that, you know, it, it gives both options, I guess. Sorry, I rambled a little bit on there. No, I think you're making a really important point. I mean, I think the key here is choice. And, you know, also, you know, if you're not feeling well, but also so many of our students work now and the intricacies of trying to negotiate work and study is so hard when you're tied down to fixed face-to-face -face lectures, you know? Um, I'm just going to open that up to either Anthony or Darren. I'm not sure if you have anything to add, or I know Kylie has another question that she's probably keen to ask, but is there anything else that you wanted to add to that idea of planning when we move to face-to-face? -to -face? Um, Sarah, I think you just hit on a really important point there that for a very long time in universities, there's been a presumption that university will be your primary focus um, and that everything else in your life you have to put aside so that you can be present on campus for 12 hours a week and do your um, homework and, and don't worry about working or your caring responsibilities or cleaning the house or doing anything else that you have to do. You're just about university. And I think the last two years have really shown that actually that was never realistic, not for a very long time, and that it, it, it's not a helpful model. And I think staff have realised that, you know, speaking as a Victorian, we have been um, immersed in the same challenges that our students have been for the last two years. We didn't have any kind of critical distance to view the situation because we were we were drowning in just the same way as all our students were, with two years of of role revolving lockdowns and freedoms and lockdowns, and and that's taken its toll on everyone, nationally, internationally, and and so we've got a situation now where suddenly people have worked out. I think the social contract is broken. Suddenly people have worked out that university isn't the only priority in people's lives, that work isn't the only priority in people's lives, that somehow we have to balance all of those other commitments to make our life function. And, and I think 
uh, as universities try to pull students and staff back on campus, as employers try to pull staff back into the office, we're going to come up with this ongoing uh, challenge to manage the realities of, of life. Uh, and we've seen a glimpse of what's possible. And I think that frightens people. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Darren, did you did you have anything else? Just yeah, I'll just quickly jump in. Yeah, I, I totally agree that social contract has now changed. Um, you know, and it, so the value judgment I think will be different from students. You know, universities and given the current market and climate, we'll need to start looking at how do we work for the student rather than have them come and work for us. Um, this situation. So the, the paradigm is shifting. And just one thing that I did want to note, um, and this came up from a student that I was working with about two weeks ago, that. Um, uh, brought this stuff up about I have to go back to campus they're a Victorian student I've got to go back onto campus they're a second year student they've never been on campus for this whole time that the pandemic's been happening um, and they're like will there be a separate orientation am I expected to know things I don't even know where the library is I've never been there um, you know they enrolled and then bang literally they were, they were in, in the pandemic so I think they'll need to be this period where we need to throw all of those assumptions out the window that a second or even a third year student may know where things are on campus, where the support mechanisms are, um, how to go and see some people face to face. A lot of staff, the same thing, will be relearning some body language skills, um, reading and interpreting um, for people because we've been used to doing it just with a headshot um of people um so there's some relearning and re-education that hopefully will all come out with some similar um things into that but yeah don't assume that your students know anything about the university or the campus or staff for that matter restructures and organizations have changed people will be going back going i don't even know who most of my colleagues are anymore or where i'm even sitting um etc so i think patience will be a virtue moving forward Thank you. Thank you, Darren. I can see Erica has her hand up patiently waiting. Over, over to you, Erica. Um, Darren, just on what you said quickly, I feel like we'll need that reorientation for life in general. I, like, I don't know how to function in society anymore. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say, I think for me, like the overall message that I wanted to get across um, for universities is that um, there needs to be an understanding that for those of us with disabilities, the sort of volatility that Maria was talking about doesn't end when the pandemic ends. It was here prior to the pandemic. It was worse and compounded during the pandemic and it will continue to exist when the pandemic is gone. Um, and so as other people's lives may start to go back to what is their normal or what is the new normal, there needs to be a continued understanding that, um, that some of us, volatility and ambiguity and all of those things are, are the normal for our lives. Um, so it would be really disappointing if the like sort of silver lining type changes that we saw during the pandemic were to um, go away, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kylie, we have very little time left, but did you want to pose one more question or? Yeah, I might, I might just get you guys to, to provide me with like a, in a, in a couple of sentences. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about what institutions can do to, um, you know, what institutions did and what institutions can do um, to increase accessibility and inclusion um, you know, during COVID-19 and, and then, you know, as we shift back into the on-campus environment. Um, I guess what, what you're, who you're speaking to in, in the room today are equity practitioners who agree with everything that you're saying, um, you know, and they're having these conversations within the institutions themselves. Um, I guess what, I, what I'd like you guys to just leave us with really is, um, you know, for, for that, that person who's sitting in the room today thinking about, you know, what can I do myself um, in terms of making this, this transition back to campus um, as easy I as I can on the student that's sitting in front of me? You know, what, what's that one piece of advice that you could give to, um, you know, to, to, the, to the practitioners that are in the room today? Anthony, I, I, I might hand over to you to, to start that one off for us. Thanks, Kylie. Uh, the thing that comes to my mind is to be kind to everyone and to recognise 
that um, everyone is doing the best that they can right now in a world that we have no experience in and we have no blueprint or roadmap for um, whatever decisions we make now will change. Whatever positions we take now will change and we just need to be kind and be flexible and respectful. Everyone's doing the best that we can. That's such an important message. Thank you for sharing that, Anthony. Um, Darren, um, in a few sentences. Well said, I guess I would agree with that. And I'd also say, um, which is surprising coming from National Assistive Technology person, technology may not be the answer to a lot of these problems. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's an assistant um, and it can be useful, but it's not the be all and end all of this. People will be and people contact um, for a lot of individuals and some of those that won't be coming back onto campus um, necessarily for, for some time, especially, you know, compromised, et cetera, as you were saying, you know, yes, but there's, there's, you know, things there that um, we won't be expecting. Everybody's not coming back as it was. Um, and and it's it, there's a permanent change kind of thing. So I think that be kind message that's there and working with and listening, and I think empathising with as well. Um, you know, staff have been doing the same thing as well in a lot of cases. So, you know, there will be an adjustment period and to your colleagues in different states. Um, you know, some have been in lockdown longer than others have. Um, so, you know, be mindful that, you know, a video conference with them might be fine, but sometimes they might want to meet up with a quick coffee if you're in town and things as well. So. Great. Thanks, Darren. Yasmin, um, you know, what, what do you want to leave us with? I think Anthony made a really good point. I think having that um, kindness and things like that. And I also think that I everyone has a different experience. So for myself, never been, never really done on in-person learning, but I've heard so many good things about it. I think it's ultimately, if we find a way to be flexible in having things for both, for anyone really, whether they have some sort of disability or not, I think having the flexibility and like we mentioned earlier, trusting and having, okay, maybe you can't do something by this time, let's move it back. I think those sort of flexibility and the communication between both um, tutors and students or coordinators and students through discussion pages and check-ins and all that kind of thing, even just being able to have small little check-ins with the students, seeing how they're going. I had a tutor who went, okay, guys, this isn't work. Okay, sorry, a coordinator that went, we haven't given you enough time for this assessment. Let's just move that back a few days, give you guys a little less stress. You know, being able to discuss with the students, how are you going? I've noticed a lot of you have been reaching out to me saying you're struggling, let's move this back. I think having that flexibility would be a really, really important thing for the future. Yeah, thanks Yasmin. And Erica, what, what would you like to leave us with? Um, I would say for the equity people in universities that um, getting the university teachers um, to understand and buy into the reality of the needs of their students is probably the most important part of creating change in this area because um, without teachers understanding what complexities their students are faced with, um, there's not a lot that students can do really um, in terms of that kind of hierarchical structure. Yeah. I, I, I think the two points that you've both made are so important. And I think just talking from a sort of a teaching perspective as an academic, I think what's also shifted on the landscape is that educators and course coordinators have actually been given permission to make these changes. So I think that would be something really key to hang on to as well. I think a lot of educators are very aware of their student needs, but they're so embedded in bureaucracy that changing an assessment item or changing a due date entails such a lot of paperwork in the old system that they just couldn't do it. So I, I'm with Anthony on this one. I think we need to leave the medieval university behind and, and fast forward into the 21st century. But I think your insights, all four of you are just so key. Yeah, I agree with Sarah. And thank you so much to each of you for your time today and for sharing your experiences. Um, I know I found that extremely valuable and seeing the comments from the chat from everyone else um, today. Um, yeah, it was very well received. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um,
We're going to move on to our um, Champions of Change for 2021. Um, following the overwhelming success um, of the initiative that we, we launched last year, um, we've, we've returned the, um, the Champions of Change again for this year. Um, following another challenging year, we asked students and staff alike to nominate someone that they felt had demonstrated being a champion for change. Uh, nominators were asked to include the reasons why they had nominated the person, and we were so delighted to see a range of individuals from across the sector being recognised in this way. Uh, we deliberately wanted to show this work and we are going to speak through all, all of the nominations um, and the recipients of the Champions of Change today because, um, you know, often people, um, equity practitioners, you know, this is an opportunity for us to say thank you, um, particularly if you haven't heard that this year. And so um, we know that it's the small gestures that each of you make um, in your day-to-day -day work that make a significant difference to the lives of students that are that are working with us in in the higher education context so um, without further ado um, I'd like to announce our champions of change for 2021 um, thanks Kylie I'll, I'll I'll kick off if you like yes you can kick off yep we're going to do these by university so we're starting alphabetically and it is um, the Australian National University. So we would like to congratulate the ANU Engagement and Success Team. Um, I won't read out all the names, you can see them on the screen, but this team deliver holistic and inclusive opportunities for all students, particularly equity students, through outreach, mentoring, storytelling, training, student partnerships, wellbeing events, orientation and transition support, physical and virtual offerings, as well as staff education. So a big team that delivers a lot of uh, content and activities. And also we'd like to acknowledge Jules Lumbers, uh, who is at the forefront of engaging with equity students and working to improve their experience at ANU. Jules has been um, uh, nominated for being passionate about fostering connections building communities and creating opportunities for students to enjoy their uni experiences and flourish. Our next champion for change is Nicholas Steep from Charles Sturt University, who is the project manager for equity and diversity. Nick is a passionate member of the equity, diversity and inclusion committee at CSU and has significant achievements in gender equity, mental health, First Nations, and in particular, the LGBTIQ plus space. Nick developed and delivered unconscious bias training and is a strong supporter of the Ally Network. And next is my, my university, Curtin University. So it gives me great pleasure in um, recognizing the Curtin Construction Management Student Support Team uh, who have facilitated the delivery of courses to incarcerated students of prisons around Australia. Um, and incarcerated student enrolments have grown at, as a direct result of their exceptional support, professionalism and commitment to social justice and equity in education. Also like to acknowledge uh, Curtin Faculty of Business and Law Learning and Teaching team. Uh, I won't read out the names, you can see them there, but this team have been dedicated to ensuring equity in higher education in Western Australia hosting the 2021 National Indigenous Business Summer School, tailoring support again for incarcerated students, developed uh, student equity groups and working groups for culture and inclusion, and have also encouraged universal design for learning for inclusivity. I'd like next like to acknowledge our colleagues from Edith Cowan University. Uh, Anne Mullaney is consistently a voice and a strong advocate for students within policy and planning. She focuses on equity and inclusion in everything she does. Her work has been a benefit to ECU and an immeasurable number of students. Secondly, we'd like to acknowledge Sue Sharp, who has provided skilled and exceptional leadership for students and staff in enabling programs at Edith Cowan University for over 30 years. Her wealth of knowledge and compassion has benefited thousands of students as they navigate their individual paths to higher education. And next it's Federation University um, and Baden Cuts. Uh, Baden has worked tirelessly to improve the access and success of students with disabilities at both Fed Uni and Fed TAFE. 
in his former life within the Disability and Learning Access Unit. His dedication and enthusiasm for inclusion and his dynamic, innovative approach to services with students have made him a champion for change within this institution. Uh, next, our colleagues from Griffith University. So firstly, Dr. Glenda Stanley has worked to develop meaningful and evaluative and deploy access and aspiration supporting programs to Pacific Islander communities of Southeast Queensland and beyond, developing practical programs, as well as a digital suite of programs to continue over COVID-19. She's an outstanding researcher as well. Secondly, Kevin, Heather Harmer was nominated as a champion for change three times. She was key to the introduction and development of the university-wide Back on Academic Track program, supporting all students, but focused on those failing to make good academic results. She is dedicated to supporting and empowering students, no matter their circumstances, and a compassionate, supportive leader who drives change and takes on initiatives that will help the well-being of others. Thirdly, Lisa Cheng is a firm advocate for mental health at Griffith University and has been for many years. Her advocacy goes beyond the confines of her job with clear impact on students and educators. Her Meaningful Minutes videos have transformed my classes and mental health video series supporting students. Ray Jobst has been a firm advocate for inclusion and accessibility, particularly in response to the rapid shift to online learning. She's continued in her stead to enhance staff's awareness about accessibility in a learning design by holding webinars, workshops, and being a constant source of support in the learning and teaching community. And finally, Sakana al works tirelessly to raise awareness for students and staff on inclusion. Her forte is in learning strategies for inclusion and educates through workshops. She is not afraid of the difficult conversations and respectfully conveys messages of inclusion and mental wellbeing awareness. And next we have the Monash University and the Faculty of Pharmacy, Pharmaceutical Sciences project team. And this team has been recognized uh, for the inclusive fac faculty community that they've created for international students through the development of an academic led student engagement program. Well done all. Next, we have our colleagues from Murdoch University who is the access programs team. They go above and beyond to support and prepare over a thousand students each year for university through our school-based and post-secondary enabling access programs in both Perth and the Peel regions. These programs have significantly boosted representation of equity students at Murdoch University. Next we have Helen Scobie. Hello Helen from another one of my ex-employees, University of Newcastle. Um, Helen is, uh, has been recognized for working tirelessly to support enabling students, a cohort primarily made up of equity students in a role as a counselor. But through all of that, she still finds time to encourage other staff with a constantly positive attitude, which is very commendable in the current times. Her skills and attitude could not be over acknowledged. Well done, he Helen. Next, we have our colleagues from QUT. Firstly, Dara McAuliff and Helen McHale are the Equity Scholarships team, who during a challenging 18 months have continued to provide high standards of service and advocate for students experiencing financial hardship. Their dedication and advocacy ensured the funding continued to reach those who were most in financial need. Next, Jasmine Linton is a genuine champion for change. She works tirelessly for social justice and to improve representation and inclusion for staff and students with diverse genders, sexual, sexualities and sex characteristics at QUT through leadership of QUT's LGBTI QA plus working party on top of her welfare day job. Next, Kate Flynn is responsible for the strategic direction of QUT's widening participation program and for the staff team. She places students and staff at the centre of her decisions, has capitalised on the changing higher education landscape and never misses an opportunity to be a champion for change. Next, we have Kim Mapleston, who has worked at QUT for over 22 years as an equity practitioner. She brings a wealth of knowledge to staff equity as program manager for QUT's signature Women in Leadership program, which targets gender equity and addressing barriers to academic and professional women in meaningful and innovative ways. Next, we have 
Kathleen and Afoa, who bring a strong cultural framework and strength-based approach to their work with Maori and Pacifica cohorts through Southeast Queensland. Their engagement, the in-school engagement program, the FAIL, champions peer-to-peer -peer learning to help young people map their post-school options. Next, we have Margaret Ridley, who has worked at QUT for 30 years as a law lecturer, equity practitioner and diversity and inclusion trainer. She was also USC Student Ombudsman in 2020 and is a social justice warrior with expertise in complaints management, special projects and cultural competence training. Next, we have Dr. Lauf, who with a very short span of time as Equity Director since March 2021, was able to deliver new strategic initiatives and a roadmap bringing efficiencies to the existing equity services, action plan for the gender and cultural diversity of staff and direct feedback mechanisms for students. And finally, uh, from QUT, we have Catherine Munyard, the Equity Communications Coordinator, who's worked at QUT for over 11 years within the equity section, making a fantastic contribution as an equity practitioner championing important diversity and inclusion programs, including awareness activities such as reconciliation, LGBTIQA+, inclusion, gender equity and widening participation. Catherine works closely with external organisations to bring all activities and the dedicated working party members to bring their unique insights. In her role on the EFIA Executive Committee, she's developed EFIA's communications and strategy, redesigned EFIA's digital presence and contributes to activities such as Wowhead. And we'd love, we'd love to thank Catherine for all of the organisation that she's done with Nina today. Catherine's sense of social justice, collaborative practice, empathy and warmth makes her an ideal champion of change. Well done, QUT. We nearly have to give you two slides, but particularly well done, Catherine, because uh, yes, I just want to echo um, Kylie to thank you for all the hard work you have done. And please keep an eye on the chat because it is hilarious. <laughs> so, sorry, on now to RMIT. Um, and this is for the Equitable Learning Services team. This team um, are, were able to swiftly pivot to provide support for students remotely during the extensive Melbourne lockdowns. Uh, the team completed proactive mental health check-ins with over 2,500 students. Well done, team. And Laura, Laura Rafferty, um, has worked for many years to address structural deficits and gaps in inclusion and equal opportunity for people underrepresented across society. She has been unstoppable in balancing competing interests in these endeavours as an equity professional, secretary of EFIA and private citizen. And can I also add as a board member for the National Centre as well. So congratulations, Laura. Next, our colleagues at Southern Cross University. Uh, Joanna is dedicated to making higher education more accessible and inclusive. Through curriculum design and teaching, she is passionate about helping students realise that learning can be enjoyable and that they can succeed. As a past student said, she showed me what I was truly capable of. Next, we have the Student Equity and Inclusion team, who has worked tirelessly demonstrating determination, flexibility, and a positive attitude in ambiguous times with very limited resources. Their creative thinking and their tenacious approach have developed programs that were able to be adopted, applied, and showcased in the current climate. And next, we have Swinburne University of Technology and uh, recognition from Melissa Lowe. And um, a lovely dedication, which I will read out. Melissa Lowe's soul is student equity. Everything she does, both professionally and personally, works towards breaking down barriers students face in accessing higher education and ensuring that each and every student has an equal opportunity to succeed at university. Congratulations, Melissa. Next, our colleagues at the University of South Australia, Kim Giannone, is it the inspiring leader of the Careers Awareness Program, which explores career aspiration pathways, including tertiary courses and building real world capacity for university students to successfully engage with their future workplaces. Next, Michelle Anderson is an advocate, advocate extraordinaire, driving the driving force behind UNI, UniSA's Ally Network, all gender washrooms and encouraging pronoun use. Passionate supporter of reconciliation, inclusivity, and respect towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Next is University of Canberra and Sarah Bruin, 
and Sarah provides vital, vital sorry, support to keep the UC Alley Network alive. And while holding the position as the secretary, she not only advocated for an LGBTIQA plus friendly community at UC, but also raised awareness of the various diversity matters for students and staff. Sarah is a true champion for change. Next, our colleagues at the University of Sydney. So firstly, Alicia Ford is a tireless advocate for students with disability. She has worked on impactful strategic projects, including UDL training, COVID-19 responses, the DESI review, and the National Disability Insurance Insurance Scheme Workforce Inquiry. She has made significant contributions to the goal of the Australian Tertiary Education Network on Disability, EFIA, ADSET, and the NDCO program. Next, Jessica Boone works tirelessly to advocate for tertiary education to be accessible to and inclusive of all students, including those with disability. She collaborates with educators, equity professionals, and key community stakeholders to improve systems and enhance knowledge, prioritizing lived experience. And next we've got the University of New South Wales. Um, so we have Katie Head. Uh, Katie has worked tirelessly to drive a program and pathway for equity cohorts throughout the pandemic and has excellent results in engaging student, students, increasing engagement by 60%, improving ATARs and the academic performance of students and the preparedness for university. And Sally Baker, congratulations Sally, who has published an online equity database, a large and inclusive collection of commentary annotations on topics related to access and participation in higher education. This gives users the ability to access and search through hundreds of thematically organized annotated academic sources. Next, we have the team at the University of Wollongong. Uh, firstly, James Terry is tireless in his role as team leader within the outreach and widening participation team at UOW. He strives to ensure that our schools and our school students from low SES areas access enriching experience and information to guide them on their education journey. Next, Joe Verco has worked across the past 18 months to provide leadership to the student accessibility and inclusion team at UOW as the team moves to a strength-based model. Joe's considerable experience and empathy as a practitioner has enabled many students to navigate and complete their studies at UOW. Sarah Smith has been working in the outreach program space for over a decade, delivering the Innovative Learning Labs program for primary and high school students. Recently, her role has expanded to include out other outreach programs, including the award-winning Curie Aspirations program and Future Finder program. Next, the Student Partnerships and Transition Team provide peer academic support and transition programs for students from all walks of life, both domestic and international. This team are committed to programs that enable students to thrive at the university and reach their higher education goals. And finally, UOW's Widening Participation Team tirelessly work to provide pathway and access programs for year 11 and 12 students across the New South Wales, South Coast, Illawarra, Liverpool and Southern Highlands regions. They are a team of champions who do amazing work. Well done, UOW. And next we have University of Queensland and the Disability Inclusion Group. Um, so this group has provided outstanding leadership and advocacy for students and staff with disability. It is led by persons with disabilities and reports to the Deputy Provost and the Chair of the University of Queensland DIG, which it, it sits on the U, UQ Senate Subcommittee for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. So well done team. Next, our colleagues from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Firstly, Marge Blowers is a true champion for change and the pride sphere in Southeast Queensland higher education is richer for your input. Marge is always the first to respond to collaborative requests, will always volunteer her time and is consistently constructive and positive, a fabulous colleague and a dedicated equity practitioner. And next, we've got USC Student Wellbeing Team who champions the wellbeing needs of USC's diverse students as foundational elements for academic success. The team makes a whole of person approach in their strategic leadership, their partnership with students and staff and responsive support to create inclusive, an inclusive learning community. 
And finally, Veronica San Marco is a champion for staff and students from equity backgrounds and instigates institutional change through initiatives such as USC's Diversity and Inclusion Plan. She has significantly expanded USC's widening participation programs and is chair of the Queensland Widening Participation Consortium and also has an executive role with EFIA. And the next is from University of Tasmania and it's our own Darren Britton who has we've just heard from in the, on the panel. So Darren has gone above and beyond in his new role as National Assistive Technology Officer. He ensures tertiary education staff and students have access to expert advice about all things assistive technology. And he also offers a supportive community of practice and a regular virtual drop-in uh, sessions and newsletters. So congratulations, Darren. And Last but certainly not least, our the University of Technology's uh, Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion student equity team, who have stayed true to the ethos and principles of student equity during this period of unprecedented disruption in 2021. The team has continued to support students in Southwest Sydney during New South Wales lockdown to ensure new 12 students are not, are not further disenfranchised. So on behalf of Sarah and myself, I'd like to thank uh, and congratulate all of our champions for change this year. And I can see that the chat is very, very active and I would encourage you all to share your congratulations with our 2021 Champions of Change. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, and I would echo that the chat is, is going off as they say. Um, so please jump in there and thank people or congratulate people, um, whichever you, you prefer. So now we're going to move on to the next and sort of final end of the um, of today's uh, session. Um, and before I do that, though, I do want to say that all the Champions for Change will be receiving a um, 2021 Champions for Change uh, pin via post in the coming weeks. This will, of course, depend on whether Australia Post is uh, up to speed with delivery. So, um, and we hope that we will all get to meet people face to face, maybe with their pins on. So in 2021, Neshi and Ifia were thrilled, um, were thrilled to offer these inaugural uh, grants for the recognition of impact. Um, our aims in offering these grants were to firstly raise awareness and the profile of equity programs and research at an institutional level, also provide an avenue for staff and student equity programs and equity researchers to receive grant funds to assist in maximizing impact of their activities, and also to offer a small funding source to provide equity practitioners the opportunity to disseminate their practice or policy or research and and to undertake ongoing professional development nationally and internationally. Thank you to all the applicants for the grants this year. We were overwhelmed by the response uh, and the quality of the applications were, um, were very, very high. So without further ado, we are proud to announce um, our applications. So perhaps we might have a, a drum roll here. Uh, Kylie, could you do a drum roll for our first winner? Drum roll. <laughs> so, um, so this is our first uh, a, a winners. Um, this is the experience of students from asylum seeking backgrounds in Australian higher education. Uh, and the, uh, the grant goes to Monash and Deakin University. So I will just give a brief overview of, of this particular project. Um, so this team fo focuses on an equity group which is often missed out in Australian higher education opportunities and those are people who are seeking asylum. It's a qualitative longitudinal program of research that has been examining the experience of scholarship holding asylum seekers undertaking Australian university studies. The aim is to understand better the factors that support this group's access to and full participation in higher education, including successfully completing their degrees. The programme of research began in 2018 with 22 students from asylum seeking backgrounds, studying at seven universities across Victoria. The first wave of interviews was conducted with, the, uh, with students um, and their average age was 22. Nine participa 
participants, sorry, were female and 13 were male. Countries of origin varied with participants coming from Iran, Afghanistan or Pakistan. All were first year undergraduate students commencing their bachelor programs and they were studying in a range of courses, engineering, science, commerce, psychology, education. 19 of the 22 were full fee paying university students and uh, some, sorry, 19 were on full fee university scholarships and some were also receiving an annual bursary. The team have now followed up on those initial 22 um, and they are looking to conduct more interviews, which we think this grant will assist them to do. There's very little research on university students from asylum seeking backgrounds. And this longitudinal research program allows uh, the team to explore the visceral realities and tensions as they attempt to navigate government and institutional policies. So I hope you uh, agree with me, it's a very worthy program of research and we're delighted to be able to award it to the team. Next, we'd like to announce RMIT's Career Success Team as the other recipients of the Australasian Impact on Equity Grants. Uh, led by Lisa Williams, the RMIT Career Success Program was established in 2018 to enhance the employability, graduate capitals and resilience of over 7,000 diverse students, including students from low socioeconomic status backgrounds, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, students from regional, rural and remote areas, and students, from, uh, students also who are seeking asylum. In response to evaluation of RMIT's institutional engagement data, stakeholder feedback, focus groups and research, a proactive and high touch program has evolved since 2018 to dedicate to include a dedicated suite of offerings tailored, at, tailored to these students' careers development needs. Based on best practice in career development learning and iterative design, the Career Success Program provides inclusive and accessible support for all students to have the same opportunities for successful employment outcomes, regardless of their background. The team has developed a service model that addresses our student cohort specific requirements based on specialist high touch interventions, proactive student outreach and a wide referral network covering internal and external stakeholders and a transparent evaluation of feedback data enabling an iterative program co-design and evolution. So part of this team's funding that's been allocated through this grant this year will be um, continuing to support the, st the staff in their professional development around their knowledge of career development, learning and equity, but also, and more importantly, to disseminate the outcomes of this program and, you know, what works in terms of career development learning for students from equity backgrounds. Um, to the broader equity sector as well. So we're really looking forward to hearing more from RMIT's career team about their program um, through the EFIA and NESHI networks in the coming months. Well, that brings uh, today's um, program to an end. Um, so on behalf of the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education, and also the Equity Practitioners in Higher Education Australasia, we would like to say uh, thank you to all equity practitioners from across the sector. It's been an, a, another uh, challenging year. Uh, so thank you all for your ongoing commitment to supporting students to access and succeed in higher education. If you aren't already, please do stay in touch with EFIA and the National Centre uh, via our newsletters or mailing lists. And we look forward to continue working with each of you in 2022. We hope that the upcoming break provides you with the opportunity to rest and spend time with your families. So thank you all for uh, attending today. And I hope you've enjoyed this as much as Kylie and I have uh, putting it all together. Kylie, do you have any last words before we finish up? I just wanted to echo your thanks, Sarah. And um, I know how difficult this year has been and um, I, I'm enthused every day by the, the people that I work with and the, um, the motivation and the, um, the commitment to student equity that they bring to, to their work every day. So thank you, everyone. And as Sarah said, enjoy the well-earned break. And uh, we're really looking forward to working with you and um, seeing you all next year.